<clears throat> yeah. yeah, all good. Uh, right, well, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm very, very grateful for the uh, invitation to talk to uh, to the BMS. Um, so the British Mycological Society is, um, is is definitely a society sort of close to my heart. Really, I've, I've been involved with it for a long a long time in various uh, various times. I was actually on its council twice. I think originally introduced by John Webster, who some of you might remember and might uh, know the, the really eminent mycologist who was something of a mentor to me when I was at Exeter. He first actually took me out on field mycology. Uh, courses and um, and what little I do know about recognizing um, fungi in the field is largely down to John's uh, John being a fantastic tutor at the time. Um, so um, so I'm really pleased to to be here and to uh, to talk to the BMS. What I'm going to do today is talk about some of our work on the rice blast fungus, and I'm going to try and answer these two questions, um, which are associated with first of all, how does um, how does the rice blast fungus infect intact host plants? Um, and then how does the blast fungus invade plant tissue? And, um, and what I'm hoping to show you is that there are some really remarkable parallels between those two processes, what happens on the leaf surface and what happens once the fungus is inside, um, inside a plant. Okay, uh, so uh, what does rice blast look like? So what type of disease is this? So, so rice blast causes a leaf spot disease on young rice seedlings, um, but also can infect all the above ground parts of a plant. But on seedlings, this is what it looks like. You see these necrotic flecks uh, on the surface of, of rice plants. But rice blast is a tremendously important disease. It destroys enough rice each year to feed 60 million people. It's endemic really in, in uh, all rice growing regions of the world. So wherever rice is grown, you'll find rice blast. In uh, rain-fed lowland ecosystems, it will cause tremendous damage, particularly on seedlings um, and also on uh, in, in upland rice. But the pathology that the farmers fear the most is this one, neck blast. So this is when the fungus will spread to the stems of, uh, of, of rice plants. And, um, and you can see this ring of sporulation around a node. And this node is just below the inflorescence that carries the rice grain, the panicle, which um, which uh, holes rice grain and when this happens you get almost complete yield loss so about 80 percent yield loss in uh, i spoke to the farmer uh, in a in the field in which i took this picture several years ago now in hunan province and he said it was about 80 percent yield loss that year from neck blast so this is a really serious pathology so blast can cause up to 30 percent yield losses each year and there are recurrent <laughs> epidemics with blast uh, really ac across the world um but the fungus is actually capable. This is an Ascomycete filamentous fungus, Magnapothera rhizis. It actually exists in multiple host limited forms. So it can actually affect more than 50 different grass species. So as well as rice, a rice sativa, it can affect millets such as Cetaria, um, forage grasses like black, uh, Brachiaria, uh, Lolium, perennial ryegrass, also the uh, finger millets um, and uh, so on as well. So it can affect many of these different species of, of, of grasses. And occasionally it will undergo a host jump. And that happened as recently as 1985, when um, the Magnapothera rhizae infecting lolium, infecting ryegrass, uh, underwent a host jump onto wheat. And that process took place in South America, in, uh, in Paraná province in Brazil. And since that time, it's spread across South America to Bolivia and uh, and also now into Argentina. But it was largely kept in check in um, in South America because rice blast, uh, wheat blast disease or brussone disease, as it's called there, um, happens in El Nino years when there's really high humidity. But was uh, the climatic conditions in other years meant that the disease never spread that far. That all changed, though, in 2016 when uh, wheat blast was seen for the first time in Asia, in Bangladesh, um, and it destroyed about 15,000 hectares in, um, in 2016. And then it spread further through 2017 through to 2019. I visited uh, Mehpur, um province in Bangladesh in 2019, and this is the symptoms that I saw. Um, it causes this bleaching of, uh, of wheat spikes and again, complete harvest loss, an absolutely devastating disease. And now the climatic conditions in Asia are absolutely perfect for wheat blast to spread. And indeed, it's spread right throughout Bangladesh. 
uh, into multiple provinces now. Another another ten provinces this year um, alone were uh, destroyed by by wheat blast. And Maripur is right on the border with um, West Bengal with India, uh, which is a big wheat growing um, country. So wheat blast really threatens wheat production. If that wasn't bad enough. Um, and this just gives you an example of what the wheat blast symptoms look like. You see that big ring of sporulation. This is fungal sporulation around the uh, around the spike, and everything above that will be rotted away. So there will be no seed set and complete harvest loss of uh, so no wheat production. But this disease emerged in Zambia, in Africa, um, and originally we thought this was an unrelated incident. But in fact, we now know that it's actually a single clonal lineage. And this is a, a, a reprint, which a preprint, which we submitted last week, which actually um, really shows that uh, that there's a pandemic clonal lineage of wheat blast. And this was work which was led by my colleague at the Sainsbury Lab, Sophie and Camun, who's really been instrumental in, in uh, the open science that's led to us being able to address this ongoing um, real challenge. Uh, as uh, as this emerging disease now spreads around the world. So a single pandemic uh, clonal lineage of the fungus has spread from South America. It's gone to Africa and to uh, Asia um, and, um, and now exists alongside rice blast for the first time in its evolutionary history with which it can actually intercross. So, uh, so a really serious problem. So Magnapothorizae causes rice blast and wheat blast, both tremendously devastating diseases. But the thing that really attracted me to Magnapothra originally as a study organism, and I started working on wheat, on rice blast when I was uh, a postdoctoral fellow um, in the United States, um, were, were two things. The first was it has this amazing developmental biology where the fungus can undergo these morphogenetic switches. It can switch from polarized growth, like when the germ tube emerges from a spore on the leaf surface, to radially symmetric growth when it forms infection structures like these apressoria, uh, which I'll talk to you about in a moment. Um, and also it undergoes some really interesting morphogenesis as it invades plant tissue. So I was really interested in its developmental biology. And the second thing was that I could do genetics um, on Magnapultha because you can carry out sexual crosses and you can carry out genetics. And so, so few pathogenic fungi are amenable to genetic analysis. And especially at the time I started studying uh, rice blast, um, I was really attracted by the idea that we could do genetic analysis on it. And that's what really attracted me to work on, on blast initially. So how does the fungus infect host plants? How does Magnapultha gain entry to a plant? Well, it does so using these um, special cells, uh, which are called apressoria. Um, and these apressoria um, are pressurized cells which form at the end of a germ tube once the spore germinates. So that three-celled spore is germinated, um, looks like a teardrop, it's a piriform cell, um, and its contents have all been trafficked into the apressorium. And you can see the apressorium on the, on the right becoming heavily melanized. So it becomes darkly pigmented at, at its cortex at the periphery of the cell. That's a thick layer of melanin that forms around the apressorium dome. So the consequence of this, and I hope you can see that the, the cell is, is, has collapsed completely, the spores collapsed completely, and its whole contents has been trafficked from three cells into one cell. The, the upshot of this is, is what you see on a leaf surface is this swollen dome-shaped infection structure, the apressorium, and then next to it, this empty bag. So this is the spore which has collapsed, and all of its contents has been trafficked now into the apressorium. Um, so how does this um, how does this cell actually function once it's uh, once it's developing this pressure, and how's the pressure generated? Well, here's a dome shaped apressorium on the leaf surface. And many years ago, we discovered that what happens inside the apressorium is that glycerol accumulates to very high concentrations. And this is work which we carried out early, very early on in in my lab when um, when I was at the University of Exeter, and um, we. Uh, discovered that glycerol accumulates to very high concentrations inside the cell, up to three molar glycerol, and that draws water in by osmosis. And the water enters the cell, but the glycerol is prevented from, uh, from leaking out of the cell because of that layer of melanin, which reduces the porosity of the cell wall. So it's permeable to water, but not permeable to any other, any other solutes. Um, that means that hydrostatic pressure increases inside the cell, up to eight megapascal, so 40 times a car tire, or 80 atmospheres. And that is then focused as protrusive force at the base of the apressorium. And that leads to a narrow, rigid penetration peg rupturing the underlying cuticle. Now, there are three prerequisites for forming an apressorium. 
And the first one, and I'm, I hope I'm not going to dazzle you with too much science here, but what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about how, uh, how this signaling pathway works. But there are three prerequisites to making an apressorium. The first one is that the fungus has to perceive it's on an appropriate surface. So it perceives um, the appropriate surface signals, and those are that it has to be on a hard hydrophobic surface. And it can also perceive signals uh, in the form of cutin monomers, um, monomers of the waxy cuticle on the rice leaf surface. And those are perceived by a series of receptors, this G-protein coupled receptor called PTH11, and a series of, of uh, receptors which are associated with membrane tension, MSB2 uh, and SHO1. Those ultimately lead to activation of two pathways. The first of them is the cyclic AMP response pathway. That leads to the, uh, the generation of the secondary messenger, cyclic AMP. And that ultimately leads to processes associated with glycerol synthesis and uh, associated with apressorium maturation. But the really pivotal um, pathway is the one here on the right, which is the PMK1 MAP kinase pathway. What happens is some proteins, RAS proteins, are able to uh, lead to phosphorylation of three kinases, MST11, which becomes phosphorylated, then MST7, and, M and then PMK1. And that's a phosphor relay, which ultimately will switch on a whole host of different genes downstream uh, that lead ultimately to apressorium development. And to give you an idea of how complex that process is, um, in the absence of that PMK1 uh, protein kinase, if we just delete the gene encoding it, then the apressorium can't form at all. So you can see the cell, the conidium no longer collapses, the apressorium hasn't formed, we've just got an undifferentiated germ tube on the leaf surface. So if we delete just a single MAP kinase, the single PMK1 MAP kinase, then we can render the fungus non-pathogenic and it can't form an apressorium at all. Now, we know that if we study the gene expression profile downstream of, uh, of mutants lacking PMK1, that we can demonstrate that it, it regulates a whole host of different genes. In fact, on a hydrophobic surface, comparing a PMK1 mutant to a wild type strain of the fungus, then almost 50 percent of the uh, of gene expression is differentially regulated. Um, and if you just look at the gene expression in response to the fungus being on a hydrophobic surface as opposed to a hydrophilic surface, then around 35% or so of the genome is differentially regulated. So that means that we can identify a group of about three and a half thousand genes, which are essential for being able to make an apressorium. So those are the, the, um, the ingredients, they encode the ingredients necessary to form this melanized infection structure. And those are regulated by a pathway ultimately that depends on phosphorylation of, of PMK1. Now, of course, this doesn't happen just at the level of gene expression. It also happens at the level of protein phosphorylation. And to, to study that process, recently we've undertaken a, an analysis where we've compared the fungus growing on a hydrophobic surface um, with a mutant lacking the single MAP kinase. And then we've uh, dis carried out mass spectrometry to identify phosphoproteins, proteins which are phosphorylated, uh, which might be direct targets uh, and indirect targets of PMK1. We've identified around 2,000 of those phosphoproteins, and then using targeted proteomics, we filtered those down to a series of 55 putative targets of PMK1. So proteins that we believe are directly phosphorylated by this protein kinase. Now, those are a really interesting set of proteins, and we can show them being differentially regulated during uh, infection, um, during apressorial development. And, and you can just see in this heat map, what we're looking at is uh, the, the, the darker, um, darker um, red or reddy brown color here would indicate proteins that are phosphorylated. You can see a whole group of proteins here that are phosphorylated in the wild type strain, but not phosphorylated in a PMK1 mutant. And those um, are involved in a whole series of different processes. So some of them encode transcription factors, genes which switch on other genes or switch off other genes. Um, also genes associated with the cyclic AMP pathway, ones associated with remodeling of the cytoskeleton, and genes associated with a whole variety of different phys physiological processes, including a process called autophagy, which I'll tell you about in a moment. So collectively, that shows that, uh, that the PMK1 map kinase is absolutely pivotal to being able to make an apressorium. The second prerequisite, though, is that this process is linked to cell cycle control. There are three nuclei, one in each compartment of the, of the conidium, and you saw one of them divide then and move into that developing apressorium. Uh, 
And what happens then is those three nuclei that are left in the spore will degrade. You see, the first one went, and then the second one will degrade in a moment, and then the third one. That process is completely invariant and happens. So every time Magna Porthera infects a rice leaf, this process happens. So a three celled uh, spore with three nuclei will undergo division and uh, become a uh, to have four nuclei and then it will go back to having a single nucleus so it goes three four one and that pattern's completely invariant and i saw that pattern many many years ago when i was a postdoc late one saturday evening in the lab and i looked down the microscope and i saw this three four one pattern uh using a stain called dappy and i remembered it and remembered that one day I would want to study it and work out what was actually happening because at that time we had no way of really understanding what was happening but i knew about this three to four to one invariant pattern many years ago um we now know that there are cell cycle checkpoints we know that the nucleus that was originally in this apical compartment this uh, apical cell had to go and undergo dna replication in order for the to switch on a signal to allow the swelling of the of the germ tube only if that nucleus then entered the um, the, the second gap phase G2 and then entered mitosis would the cell actually mature and only if it exited mitosis correctly uh, would the apressorium actually be able to function properly um, and we know that the whole pathway of Magna Porthera is actually really um, uh, closely orchestrated with cell cycle control so that's the second prerequisite the third one is this conidium really does have to die it has to undergo regulated cell death um, and we know that because we can inhibit that process. The process by which the spore collapses is a process called autophagy. And autophagy literally means self-eat or self-consume. So what happens is that there's a process of autophagic cell death. The conidia uh, will collapse and die. Um, and we can see that in a, in a wild type, we've got a single nucleus in each of these apressoria. But then this mutant, an ATG8 mutant, which is a component of uh, the autophagy pathway, then you can see there are still three nuclei left inside the uh, the, the spore and the germ tube. They're distended, distinctly unhappy looking because they can't be degraded by autophagy. Um, a nucleus has moved into the apressorium, but the apressorium is, is, uh, will melanize, but it won't ever uh, reestablish polarity. So it's unable to actually cause disease. Um, so the spore really has to collapse and traffic all of its contents into the apressorium if that infection structure is to work. So what happens next? Well, at the base of the apressorium, there is an area where there's no melanin called the apressorium pore. That area undergoes severe membrane curvature generation and then sends this rigid penetration peg into the underlying uh, cuticle. And we know that the uh, fungus has to undergo remodeling of its cytoskeleton. Uh, a, a filamentous actin network forms this donut shape, this ring structure at the base of the apressorium. And that bounds the apressorium pore. And it's held in place by a remarkable group of proteins called septins. And these septin GTPases are proteins which are necessary to scaffold actin and to enable the fungus to actually reorient its axis of polarity and grow in a different direction. Now, septins were discovered many years ago in yeast, um, and they're associated with cell division, with cytokinesis. Um, and a, a group of septins, the core septins, sept three, four, five, and six, collectively form this hetero-oligomeric ring structure. Uh, and you can see these beautiful rings at the base of the apressorium. And we know that the septins themselves are absolutely essential for the apressorium to function. So if we knock out any of those septin genes, so set three, four, or five, or six, uh, then the actin ring doesn't form properly. We get this tangled mess of actin of the cytoskeleton. Um, and that means the fungus is unable to form the penetration hypha as it would do in a wild type. So it can't form the penetration hypha at all. And that renders the fungus non-pathogenic. So it can't cause disease in the absence of the septins. You get some necrotic flecking, but the fungus is unable to infect uh, rice leaves. Uh, so septins are critical to being able to infect a, a, a rice plant. Now, what do those septins do? Well, what their main role is to organize the apressorial pore. So we can see in this series of micrographs beneath the, the cells that at the base of the apressorium, there's a, a ring structure and there's two of the septins, sept five and sept three, that form this ring structure. That leads to formation of this um, donut shaped uh, ring uh, conformation of actin. Um, this is an actin binding protein, gelsilin, which is all organized around the center of that ring. Uh, a septin kinase, CHM1, also in that conformation. 
protein involved in endocytosis, which is right in the center of the appressorial pore, and then proteins involved in repolarization, T1 involved in, um, in the ARP2-3 complex, so part of the actin repolymerizing complex, and XO70, which is involved in secretion, polarized secretion. Now, what you can see beneath this is a mutant called SLN1, where none of those things are happening correctly. So we, we can see that this mutant is unable to undergo any of those organizational processes. And this was a mutant we discovered some years ago, which is unable to detect when a sufficient level of turga has been generated inside this, the appressorium. So this mutant fails to um, measure when a sufficient threshold of turga has been generated. And it just carries on making turga, but it never repolarizes. Um, and it's a really interesting um, protein. And you can see that in an SLN1 mutant, rather than that ring structure forming, as we saw previously in the previous movie, you can see that there's a, a patch of septins there labeled in green, sept5, and you can see it basically moving to the center and then ultimately degrading. And what I hope you can also see is the aprosorum getting darker and darker and darker. And that's because it's undergoing a futile cycle of melanization. It's continually making melanin and it's continually accumulating glycerol um, until ultimately the cell would burst. But it's never able to repolarize and actually cause disease. So this turga sensor uh, measures when a threshold of turga has been generated and then translates that into physical force to enable the fungus to, to rupture the cuticle and gain entry to the leaf tissue beneath it. Now that SLN1 um, protein is at the center of another pathway. Uh, it actually interacts with stretch activated gated ion channel proteins in the membrane, which are measuring pressure. Um, it then phosphorylates a series of, um, of proteins, again, interacting with the protein kinase C cell integrity pathway. Um, part of what it phosphorylates is the NOx complex that leads to septin aggregation. Um, and then also it, it modulates and downregulates uh, glycerol formation and melanization. So it will prevent those processes from occurring, which is why when you take SLN1 away, then you get lots of melanin and lots of glycerol formation. You get those very dark cells forming. Um, so what that's suggested to us is that um, septins are, in fact, a, um, a key element of how the cell is signaling to change growth direction and repolarize to form effectively what will ev eventually become a polarized fungal hypha, a pen, uh, uh, this rigid penetration peg. So moving from this dome-shaped yeast-like cell to a, uh, a filamentous cell. And the septins are an organizing center that they organize all of these proteins involved with repolarization. And also we now know a number of proteins involved in virulence that are also organized in a septin-dependent manner to enable the fungus to prepare itself for infecting the rice leaf. Okay, so that's what happens on the leaf surface. So we know that there's this process by which an appressorium forms and then is able to generate pressure and lead to penetration of, um, of, of rice tissue. But what happens next? How does the fungus invade plant tissue? So once it's gained entry to the leaf, what happens next? Well, if we just look at this process, here's the appressorium on the leaf surface, and then we can uh, computationally remove that plant tissue and then see what's inside the plant. Well, we can see now this bulbous branched invasive hypha. Um, so those invasive hyphae will rupture, um, uh, they've ruptured the cuticle and then they've gained entry to the leaf tissue. And you can see that the way they grow is not like a classical fungal hypha, um, but they grow more like a pseudo hyphal uh, yeast cell. They undergo axial budding. They actually undergo a budding means of growth. So different than a filamentous fungus. Uh, and more like an invasive growth by, by a yeast-like organism. And that's what happens when they grow initially, and then eventually they'll become more classically cylindrical as they move from, from cell to cell, as you'll see in a moment. Um, but remarkably, the fungus, although it's ruptured the cell wall and it's ruptured the uh, cuticle of the plant, it doesn't uh, rupture the plant plasma membrane. So what we're looking at here, this is a transgenic rice plant where we've targeted green fluorescent protein to the plasma membrane. So we're looking at the outline of rice cells. And in magenta here, we're looking at um, the fungus, which is now labeling a cytoplasmic uh, red fluorescent protein, which we, we force colored it to magenta so you can see it clearly. And the fungus you can see is bounded by the plasma membrane of the plant. So it invaginates the plant plasma membrane. So the fungus is growing inside the rice cell, but bounded by the plasma membrane. So the rice cell is still intact and still alive. 
And that's really critical. And that's a hallmark of biotrophic pathogens, pathogens that are able to, um, to maintain the viability of cells they infect in their, in their host. And Magnaportha grows like that. It grows inside uh, rice cells. Now, remarkably, as it moves from one cell to the next, it's able to maintain that membrane integrity. And we call this the extra invasive hyphal membrane, although it's a plant membrane. Um, you can see it labeling the, uh, this fungal hypha that, that's moved into an adjacent cell. Now, at the tips of each of these fungal cells, you can see a bright structure. This is um, a focal immune response produced by the plant. And ultimately, it will become a structure called the biotrophic interfacial complex, which is a plant structure um, which the fungus then uh, hijacks and uses to deliver proteins into, into plant cells. You can see the fungus, the initial cell that was invaded by the fungus, though, is beginning to lose its membrane integrity. So the fungus is actually allowed this cell to die, but the cells it's invading are alive and will remain alive. And this is, a, again, a hallmark of the way the fungus grows. It will always occupy and, and move into living tissue. But the cells, uh, the, the cells which it's, uh, it, it's colonized initially um, will ultimately be degraded and lose their viability. So this is a, what's called a hemibiotrophic means of growth. It grows into living tissue, but the tissue at the center of its um, colony will, uh, will, will ultimately die. And then it will use the contents of those to fuel its aerial growth and sporulation from the center of what will become a lesion, a disease lesion. Now we can see the fungus actually um, utilizing one of those focal immune responses. And its response to that is to bud. You saw it on this side. It, 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 it underwent this budding process. Uh, so there's the fungus budding and producing this swollen hyphal structure. And then the, the, what originally started as this um, uh, plant response, this very bright plant response, becomes a, a process, a, a structure called the biotrophic interfacial complex, or BIC, as we call it. Now, at the same time, what I hope you also saw was this green fluorescence flooding into the gap between the plant plasma membrane and the fungal cell wall, the apoplast. And this is a protein which is an effector, a protein which is actually involved in the suppression of plant immunity. But it, this protein suppresses extracellular immune responses that happen um, between the fungal cell wall and the plant plasma membrane in that space. And it will suppress plant immunity in that, in that space. And that's one of the types of effectors that are produced. But Magna Porta produces two types of effectors. So there are effectors like the green one here, BAS4, uh, which is secreted into the gap between the fungal cell wall and the plasma membrane. They suppress extracellular immune responses. But the other group of effectors go directly into plant cells. And to do that, they seem to utilize this BIC structure, uh, which you can see here in, in magenta. Um, and they are secreted through that portal um, and they end up inside rice cells where they will suppress intracellular immune responses. They'll locate and bind to proteins which are involved in pathogen recognition by the plant and they'll prevent them working. And in this way, the fungus is able to actively suppress plant immune responses, enabling it to grow very quickly in, uh, in rice tissue. Now, Magna Portha produces many, many effectors. Um, so remember its genome size we talked about before it has around 12,000 or so genes well there's around 800 secreted proteins produced by the fungus um, when it uh, grows inside plant tissue um, there's 863 putative effectors and those are expressed in in uh, co-regulated modules during infection so you can see them um, during the stages of fungal infection we can see different modules of gene expression. So there's one group which, for example, uh, peak in expression um, at eight hours after infection, module two. There's another group that peak in expression at 16 hours after infection, another group peak in expression at 24 hours, another group at 48 hours, and so on. So they'll express um, temporarily during plant infection. And you can see that what they're doing is suppressing specific defense responses in the plant that are switched on at different times during infection. And in that way, they're enabling the fungus to rapidly proliferate and move from cell to cell inside plant tissue. And we know uh, some of the proteins with which they interact, but a lot of work in our lab currently is associated with trying to un understand and identify the targets of these, of these proteins. Now, the consequence of this is the fungus can move really rapidly in plant tissue. And you get an idea of this in this three-dimensional reconstruction of what happens inside um, a rice leaf. 
Uh, what I hope you can see is that the fungus is able to uh, to occupy a lot of plant tissue um, very rapidly. And these bulbous branch hyphae, which you can see in three dimensions here, these green hyphae have now spread into epidermal and mesophyll cells. And they've also spread into vascular tissue where they become more classically cylindrical. And the fungus will rapidly colonize plant tissue. So those effectors are incredibly effective at suppressing immunity and enabling the fungus to, to suppress uh, overwhelm its host, completely overwhelm immune responses and move very, very rapidly into plant tissue. This is only about um, two days or so after infection where the fungus is already really um, rapidly colonizing plant tissue. The other thing that these uh, live cell imaging are able to do was to look for the first time at the way in which the fungus moves from one rice cell to the next. So this is a live cell imaging of a, of a living host, um, a living plant. So this is the entire plant, uh, which we then um, done live cell imaging. And this is a green fluorescent protein, um, so you hooked to a, um, an actin binding protein. And what I hope you can see is the fungus will encounter that um, border between two rice cells. It will then undergo severe hyphal constriction. And you can see that flash of green, and that's an actomyosin contractile ring. The fungus is constricting and then moving into the adjacent cell. Now that hasn't happened randomly, that's happening at particular points in rice cells, which are called pit fields. And this is where plasma desmata accumulates. So if you remember your plant biology, plasma desmata are the conduits which enable cytoplasmic continuity between plant cells. Um, so they enable plant cells to communicate with one another. Now those channels are perceived by the fungus as a weak point and the fungus is able to move through those, um, uh, uh, move through those pit fields and enter the adjacent cell. Now, if we want to look at this in further detail, what we can do is carry out some transmission electron microscopy. So I'm gonna show you some images now where we've sliced through one of these junctions uh, using transmission EM to actually try and see that constriction point in more detail. So we've done numerous slices through that region, and then we've done a three-dimensional computer uh, tomographic reconstruction, and that's enabled us to measure the degree of hyphal constriction. So the fungus will constrict to a point which is 360 nanometers in diameter, and that's the same diameter as a pit field. So it's able to find a pit field, and it's able to move directly through that region from one rice cell here into this adjacent rice cell uh, next to it. Um, so, so that crossing point occurs. So how is the fungus actually achieving this process? How does it do this? Well, to learn about that process, we actually went back to this pathway, which I talked to you about at the beginning of the talk, PMK1. So the PMK1 map kinase pathway, remember this is absolutely required for making an apressorium. But what we remembered is if you take a PMK1 mutant, which normally, remember, doesn't form an apressorium, if you just take um, spores of that mutant or indeed mycelium from the mutant you can inject them directly into rice tissue but they're still unable to cause disease so that always suggested to us that this map kinase probably played a role in invasive growth not only at prosorium development but also growth of the fungus inside plant tissue but how do we study that process? Because as soon as you delete the gene encoding PMK1, then the fungus can't form an apressorium, so it can't infect. So what we realized is we needed to make a conditional mutant. We wanted to be able to switch this kinase off um, directly and to be able to do that in a very controlled way. So we carried out a process called chemical genetics. And the way this works is we made a point mutation in the ATP binding pocket of the kinase. And that point mutation sh changed the shape of the ATP binding pocket so that it will now bind to an ATP analog, which is a drug called naphthal PP1, which is a kinase inhibitor. So if we introduce this back into the fungus, we can produce a strain of the fungus where we can simply add a kinase inhibitor and switch off PMK1. And we can do that at any point during the life cycle. So we can then conditionally inactivate this single kinase. So to test that process, what we did is the following experiment. We know that, remember, PMK1 is responsible for making apressoria. So this PMK1 analog sensitive mutant, AS mutant, will make an apressorium normally. But if we add a drug, naphthal PP1, then the apressorium can't form. And um, we can test the kinase and show that it's inactivated. Um, so that suggested that this would work. So then we could carry out the experiment we'd always wanted to do, 
which is to let the fungus invade rice tissue and then inactivate the kinase. So first of all, we did this experiment in the absence of the drug. So this is what happens normally. This is what happens in a wild type, but this is the PNK1 analog sensitive mutant. It's growing inside a rice epidermal cell. It will locate those pit field sites. It will then undergo the hyphal constriction and it will move through into the adjacent cells. And you can see, I hope that's a remarkably synchronous process. The fungus fills in epidermal cells, growing rapidly inside the epidermal cell. And then within a few hours, you can see that it's located the uh, cortex. It's then undergone the hyphal constriction and about six hours or so after infection, you see seven hours and 30 now, it's now moved through into the adjacent rice cells. Well, now we're going to carry out the exact same experiment, but this time we're going to add the kinase inhibitor, naphthol PP1. Um, so this is what happens when you add the drug. So we've got the same mutant. You can see it filling the epidermal cell. So it will fill the epidermal cell and it's undergoing the cortical scanning. It's moving to the edge of the cell, but it's completely trapped and it can't escape. So, and in fact, it never gets out of that rice cell. Um, and you can see in this image, here's the apressorium out of focus on the leaf surface. Here's the fungus filling the epidermal cell. Um, it's making its way to the edge of the cell, but it's, it can't escape and it can't enter these adjacent cells. Um, so that suggests that the PMK1 MAP kinase, as well as being involved in apressorial morphogenesis, it's also required for being able to move from one rice cell to the next rice cell. Well, we know that plasma desmata, those conduits, are the sites of plasma, uh, of immunity. So these are immune responses. So pathogens are actually perceived at these um, junctions. Uh, reactive oxygen species generation occurs and salicylate uh, production occurs, a plant hormone. They actually lead to callosynthase and then occlusion of plasma desmata using callos. Um, now, what we know now um, is that magnaporthos suppresses all of those processes from occurring normally. But in the absence of PMK1, it can't do that. It can't suppress plasma desmatal immunity. It's unable to do that. Um, so we know that PMK1 must be involved in the, the process of, of suppression of immunity at these junctions as well. Now, to study that process in detail, we carried out this experiment where we, first of all, um, did the same experiment I've shown you in, uh, using microscopy. We allowed the fungus to infect rice tissue for 26 hours. We then added the drug, naphthol PP1. We then allowed it to progress for 32 hours. Now the wild type will start invading adjacent cells, but the uh, naphthol PP1 in, um, treated cell will be will uh, the fungus will be trapped. At that point, we isolated RNA, and then we carried out RNA sequencing to find out what's happening to global patterns of gene expression. Well, what that showed us is that there are more than 700 fungal genes that are significantly down-regulated. Um, in this PMK1AS mutant after inactivation. 212 of those encode secreting proteins and around uh, 59 of those are temporarily co-regulated with our effectors. And they're in fact two, in two of the modules, modules four and five. Um, so what that suggests is that Magnaporta is not only switching on genes associated with hyphal constriction, um, which are involved in that um, shape change, but they're also um, producing um, stimulating expression of effector encoding proteins, which are going to suppress immunity at those cell-to-cell uh, -cell junctions as well. So how then does the fungus cross these cell walls? How is it actually doing the process? What's actually happening at those junctions? Well, again, here we have to return to our um, favorite proteins in my lab, really the septins, the septin GTPases. So remember that I showed you there, there was that beautiful septin ring, a big green ring at the base of the appressorium. And that uh, was bounding the appressorial pore, the, the, the zone from which the penetration peg would emerge and ultimately would penetrate the rice tissue, uh, the, the rice leaf surface. Well, a very similar thing is happening inside the cell at a junction. You can see here's the fungus inside this rice cell. It's now going to move into the adjacent rice cell. And these invasive hyphae are doing that. But at each of the crossing points, you can see a septin collar. And if we were to turn that through three dimensions then uh, or, or turn it through 90 degrees, we'd see there's a ring there. So again, we see a ring structure, a collar structure at each of those crossing points. And we know that that process is regulated by PMK1. So again, we can carry out exactly the same experiment we did before. 
So here's our crossing point in the absence of the drug in this PMK1 analog sensitive mutant. So septins accumulate at those crossing points. And you can see at each of the crossing points, there's these beautiful septin collars that you can see at the base of the of, at the base of the uh, of this structure. But when we add the naphthol PP1, we add the drug and the fungus is now trapped, remember, inside the cell, then the septins don't accumulate. We can see a gradient of septins, um, but they can't form that ring conformation. They can't form the collar. And we know that if we inhibit septin aggregation directly um, using mutants in the septins, temperature sensitive mutants, then they are unable to cause invasive growth. Um, so the process, again, is, is septin dependent, again, mirroring what happens inside the apressorium. So that structure we call the transpressorium. So we realize that there really are remarkable parallels between the apressorium on the leaf surface, which is involved in, um, in surface penetration and entry into, into rice um, tissue, and also a structure formed by the fungus when it's moving from one rice cell to the next. But this name, transpressorium, is not a term that we coined at all. This was first coined in 1964 by a group of German mycologists who were actually studying wood rotting fungi. And they noticed that there were swollen structures that enabled the fungus to move from one um, uh, plant cell to the next. And they called them transpressoria. And, and we believe that they were really onto something, that what they were, they were actually incredibly farsighted in, in identifying the fact that this is a, a specialized infection structure, that when the fungus meets an obstacle inside a rice plant, it does a, a similar process analogous to what's happening on the leaf surface. It will undergo the swelling process. It will then undergo hyphal constriction, form a peg structure, which is very similar to a penetration peg. And the process is in fact, dependent on the same mitogen activated protein kinase cascade and it's septin dependent. So very similar to what happens inside an apressorium. In cartoon form, you can see what's what's happening here. So there's our penetration peg on the leaf surface. And here's what happens inside a rice leaf. So PMK1 is leading to effector gene expression. That's suppressing host defense mechanisms, particularly at plasma desmata. But also it's undergoing host sensing and cytoskeletal remodeling. So it's leading to septin aggregation and actin remodeling, uh, which will lead to these hyphal constrictions to a septin collar and then septin mediated invasive growth into the adjacent cell. So the transpressorium here mirroring very much what happens uh, in the apressorium on the leaf surface. Okay, so that's what happens in invasive growth. And what I hope you can see is that again, there are really remarkable parallels between what happens on the leaf surface and what happens inside a rice plant um, and, uh, and, and, and that process. And these are the processes which we're most concerned with in my lab. But what I'm going to do now in the final couple of minutes is I'm going to preempt what I think would have been the first question that I might have got from this audience, which is, OK, this is really fascinating cell biology, I hope. Um, but what are you doing about solving rice blast disease? Because you've just told us this disease is actually um, causing a huge humanitarian and social issue. So what are you doing about that process? Well, we're carrying out some applied work. Um, to try and really address in the short term mechanisms to understand uh, rice blast disease. And this is a project that we're carrying out in sub-Saharan Africa. And what we're trying to do is to use the pathogen to guide uh, local plant breeding processes that are, will enable durable rice blast resistance to be deployed in some of the poorest regions of the world. So first of all, we collected um, more than a thousand rice blast isolates uh, from all of those countries, Kenya, Tanzania, Uganda, Egypt, Benin, Togo, Mali, Malawi, Burkina Faso, the Cote d'Ivoire, um, Nigeria and Burundi. So we collected a, a whole series of different rice blast isolates and we have really intensive collections, particularly from Kenya, Tanzania um, and also uh, from um, from Uganda, Rwanda, from uh, from from West Af uh, from East Africa and then an analogous collection as well, particularly from Burkina Faso. So we then uh, genotyped all of these isolates and we sequenced around uh, 20 of those, but we also genotyped all of them in terms of, um, in terms of their overall phylogenetic relationship. We then pathotyped them on a whole series of rice lines, which differ by 33 different rice uh, resistance genes for, to rice blast. And we determined the prevailing set of 
um, avirulence gene products, so products encoding effectors, which are recognized by these resistance genes, to use that process to inform pl um, plant breeding. So in cartoon form, what we're doing is, is essentially this. So when fungi infect plants, they're able to secrete effectors, which we've talked about. Most of those effectors will suppress immunity. So things like this pump triggered immunity, these surface receptors, and it will downregulate immunity. But plants have countered that by having intracellular immune receptors, uh, which will locate those effectors, bind to them um, either directly or indirectly, and lead to an immune response, which will lead to resistance. Now, when farmers deploy resistance genes, what they're deploying are genes encoding these intracellular receptors called NLRs. Now, in, in rice blast, what this means is that we can, uh, if we take this strain, for example, um, this strain has uh, doesn't have an effector that's recognized by PI50, so that means it can cause disease on this, but it must have an effector which is recognized by PI2, PI9, and PIZT resistance genes. And that means the, fun the plant will be, uh, rice lines containing those resistance genes will be resistant to that particular strain of the fungus. However, if we uh, analyze another strain, you can see that this strain has broken the PI2 resistance gene and the PIZT resistance gene, and the one below it has broken the um, the uh, the genes encoding PI9 and uh, and PI2, for example, and PI50. So you can see that if you sample the entire population, that you can build up an idea of what the prevailing rice blast population is like and which genes would give you the maximum amount of protection against the prevailing population. And that's indeed what we did. So we identified that if we take the entire African population of rice blast, then um, the genes which will exclude most of the population are PI5, PISH, PI2, PI1, PI9, and PIB. So these six resistance genes will give you the maximum protection against rice blast. But we know that that will never be enough, that we know that the fungus will overcome this simply by mutating the cognate um, corresponding AVR effectors, um, because it has so many effectors, it can have redundancy in this. So what we also need are a whole series of non-host resistance uh, genes and uh, non-race specific genes like PI35, which is a QTL, it's a polygenic gene, uh, same with PIA35, and PI21 is a recessive resistance gene. It's a, a dominant susceptibility factor, which when you mutate it, will lead ultimately to resistance. And what we've now done is started to pyramid these different resistance specificities into locally adapted African uh, elite rice cultivars. And we've paired major resistance genes with these polygenic resistances to produce new rice lines that we can deploy in the field. And the point we're at now is we've carried out field testing. We're actually in our third year of field testing. We were somewhat affected by COVID. Um, but we're in our third year of, of, um, of testing, and we're doing that in seven different countries across Africa. And we're testing these lines, which we've generated in the Philippines, in the International Rice Research Institute, and also in a mirror project in, um, in Kenya, um, organized by Calro. Um, so a local breeding process and a parallel breeding program in Burkina Faso. And then those locally adapted cultivars are now in field trials, uh, to see how they perform uh, against severe disease pressure. And we're analyzing the results currently um, with, uh, with regard to that. So how does that project look like? Well, it involves a huge number of people in many, many countries. It also involves a huge amount of outreach. So we actually carry out a farmer consultation, grower consultation. Um, we're able to, um, to then work out um, diagnostic um, procedures and interventions. We've produced a whole series of fact sheets um, and, uh, and even phone apps that enable farmers to actually monitor rice blast and also an ongoing disease surveillance system, which is coordinated from uh, back at Ilri in Nairobi, by which we're continually uh, collecting the um, prevailing rice blast isolates so that we've got an ongoing disease surveillance program. And then our plant breeders uh, are associated with, uh, with producing uh, these um, potentially durably resistant lines. So it's an ongoing locally driven pathogen surveillance system, a whole network of trained professionals. So we've trained actually more than 60 uh, extension agricultural scientists to uh, advise farmers, uh, particularly in Kenya and Tanzania, 
uh, these durable disease resistant rice cultivars and then a, a whole culture of farmer and consumer engagement. So the cultivars we've used are the ones which the farmers grow the most and the ones with the greatest consumer acceptance and consumer benefits, uh, which is a really important facet of the project. And these address a whole series really of the millennium uh, sustainability goals, particularly the one associated with uh, with zero hunger. Um, so uh, so those are some of the things we're doing to, to really try and address uh, rice blast uh, and the urgent problem presented by it. So just to summarize everything I've told you then, so the fungus makes this specialized cell, the aprosorium, that uh, leads to infection of rice plants. That's a septin dependent process of aprosorial penetration. It involves this sensor kinase, which determines when a threshold of turg has been reached. Once the fungus is inside a, a, a leaf, it undergoes this tissue invasion very rapidly. That involves deployment of a whole battery of different fungal effectors and more than 800 effectors. Um, the fungus makes a special infection structure called a transprosorium, and that mirrors what we see um, on the leaf surface. So there are remarkable developmental parallels between aprosoria and transprosorial morphogenesis um, during rice invasive growth. And then in, in our applied work, we're carrying out this pathogen-based plant breeding program in sub-Saharan Africa to lead to uh, durable uh, rice blast disease control. And that parallels some work we're doing in Bangladesh uh, to, to study wheat blast, where we're really trying to understand and come up with new uh, interventions based on gene editing there to understand and control uh, wheat blast disease. So who did this work? Well, I've got, I'm very lucky. I've got a very talented group of uh, people in my lab who did uh, this work. Um, so Lauren Ryder did all the work on turga sensing kinase. Um, Andy Foster developed our CRISPR gene editing process. Miriam has now got a, a lab in Spain, but she carried out all the work on PMK1 um, and its association with transcriptional regulation. Sha Yan, um, uh, looked at and identified that whole suite of different effectors and has been studying their biology in, uh, in a really uh, mammoth effort that she's led uh, in carrying out that process. Vincent, who's currently um, visiting Kenya and visiting our, our African field sites, um, he's worked on all of, he coordinated that project across sub-Saharan Africa, but also has been associated with understanding the biology of an effector. Bozeng, who, who uh, has moved to a, another group in TSL, but Bozeng has led um, some work looking at effector regulators and, uh, and has um, produced some really novel work where he's actually identified an effector regulator um, that uh, regulates that, some of those effectors. Neftali has worked on phosphoproteomics, so he's just uh, completed his PhD and he's worked on all of that phosphoproteomic analysis. Weibin is our technician who um, underpins all of our work really in, uh, in infection. Iris uh, leads um, our work on septins, uh, so another of our talented postdocs who's associated with, she's understanding all of the different septin interactions that, uh, that take place. Um, and uh, Clara Sharnagel uh, works on lichens, and some of you in the audience I suspect are quite interested in lichens, so I will show you one slide on lichens in a second. Um, and uh, Alice Essaola did all that wonderful life cell imaging. So very talented cell biologist, um, microscopist who carried out all of that work. Camilla now is leading a whole program to look at. Uh, she's a new PhD student uh, in the second year of her PhD and she's looking at effector regulators and carrying out a genetic screen. And Belaine is, um, uh, is looking at um, the analysis of uh, what happens in, to, to rice cells when they become in, infected with rice plants. But in a, in a prior piece of work, she also carried out a lot of the plant breeding for our sub-Saharan African uh, project when she, was, uh, when she was in the Philippines. And, uh, and a whole series of uh, people in my lab that were associated with cell biology, including visiting scientists like Maricela, who was uh, with us last, uh, a couple of summers ago, uh, working uh, again on cell biological aspects of infection. Um, and um, my talented colleagues, Frank Menke leads our proteomics group, and he um, really, uh, he co-supervised Neftali and all that phosphoproteomic work. I've got some great colleagues, Sophie and Kamoon, we collaborate with extensively on wheat blast, um, but also Matt, Jonathan, Peter, Cyril and Wembo, um, the other group leaders at the Sainsbury Laboratory, uh, and all of the groups that support us and carry and, and help us carry out all of our work, Dan, Mark and, uh, and Matthew. And these are some of my external collaborators 
including, I really need to mention Samuel Mutiga, who is the, the linchpin of the project in sub-Saharan Africa, who, who holds all of that work together. Most of our work was funded by the Gatsby Charitable Foundation, but also the work in Africa by GCRF, the Global Challenge Research Fund, until the government cut its funding. And then the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation uh, funded the initial work um, and, uh, and the ERC um, funded uh, a whole series of work and, and indeed uh, are just about to fund a new series of work were it not for the follies of Brexit. Um, but um, but they uh, have uh, have indeed been instrumental in, in providing a lot of the funding that, that's happened in, in our lab. And because I know there's a few mycologists in the audience who probably love lichens, I just want to tell you that we are studying, this is my little sideline project, um, because I've always been fascinated in lichens. This is a lichen called um, called Xanthoria parietina, which many of you are probably seeing growing on rooftops and on, on plants. These are its apothecia. This is a remarkable symbiosis between a filamentous ascomycete fungus and uh, an alga called Trabuxia, which you can see false color imaged in green here. Um, and uh, and I know, I think Paul, I saw Paul Dyer in the audience. So Paul's a lichen enthusiast who's involved, uh, who led the genome pro project for Xanthoria. And he's been very helpful in, in helping us set up a whole series of analyses in, in, uh, in both this um, fungus, Xanthoria, and also another fungus, um, another lichen, Cladonia. And we're trying to understand the early changes in gene expression that lead to these remarkable morphogenetic switches that enable these higher order structures to be formed uh, by lichens. So uh, that's work I hope will progress in the next in the next few years. OK, I'm uh, I'm happy now to address and answer any questions that you might have and um, and look forward to the discussion. So thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, it's Emma here from the, from the BMS. Hey. Um, wow. Uh, what an amazing bank of research from a, a hugely impressive group of individuals. Um, mm. So uh, looking back at some questions. So um, the first questions have come in from um, from Jan, Jan Quinn. Uh, she said she had two questions. It actually turned into three. So I'm going to read all three parts of the question, um, but the, you might need to address each separately. So you may want yeah. to have a look at them in the chat as well. So I'll just read them out. So Jan says, um, what signals are SHOW1 and MSB2 recognizing to signal to PMK1? And are all the signals through SLN1 hog independent? She says she's guessing NOXR is not a response regulator. So how does SLN1 regulate its phosphorylation? It's yeah, three, really, three, really yeah. <laughs> thanks, Jan. Really good questions. So, um, so, and I'm not going to be able to answer all of them. So in terms of what the show one and MSB2 uh, recognize, we still don't really know what the signal is. They've been implicated in serving those positions largely just simply based on, um, on, on mutational analysis. Um, now, SLN1 um, probably interacts with a response regulator protein called, um, which is its, uh, which is its, uh, its YPD, which is its, its, its partner as, uh, in the same way the SLM1 pathway operates in yeast. Now we know that's involved in the osmotic response. We don't yet know it's involved in the appressorial terga response because the YPD mutants don't make uh, appressoria. They well, because they don't make conidia. So because they can't sporulate, we're gonna we're trying to make a conditional mutant. In fact, what we're trying to do with with SLN1 as well is to try and develop a a, a conditional means of inactivating it. So partly so we can actually understand how that two component regulatory system works. So what we're first doing is looking at the analysis of how the um, how the SLM1 pathway works during hyperosmotic stress adaptation, and then uh, which will be hog dependent. And then what happens during um, appressorial morphogenesis, which we know, as, as you say, that turgor generation in the appressorium is hog independent. So we know that if you, if you, in fact, if you osmo stress an appressorium, it will start making its osmotic compatible solute, which is a rabbitol, and it will do that in a hog dependent manner. Uh, so hog we call OSM1 in Magnaportha, but it's, um, but that hog map kinase is responsible always for hyperosmotic stress adaptation, but it's it's uh, dispensable for um, for appressorial turga generation. So so that's. And, and Noxar indeed, Noxar is the regulator of um, of the um, of the NADPH oxidase complex, and its phosphorylation appears to be dependent on PKC on protein kinase C, 
So it's indirect. So SLN1 seems to activate protein kinase C and the phosphorylation goes through PKC. We don't yet know whether that's direct or indirect. Um, so that's the best I can answer the questions I think at the moment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so another question from Linda. Linda says, how can van der Plank's horizontal breeding model be deployed in this gene-focused breeding? Well, I, th I think what you're seeing is, in fact, that we are doing that really, because the um, so those QTLs, so PI um, PI A35 and PI35, they are actually both QTLs, so they are horizontal resistance effectively. So they are a, a means by which we're in fact doing that. So, so what we want to do, we we don't want to impose huge d disease uh, pressure by just pyramiding dominant R genes. Um, what we want to do is to is to make sure that there are always multiple specificities. So everything we have, every line we have, has always got the recessive resistance gene PI twenty one, which is um, the gene product is a is actually a proline rich um, susceptibility factor encoding um, protein, and um, and when you mutate it, you lead it leads to recessive resistance, which which has uh, which is pretty durable. Um, but we want to make sure that's always in the same background. But then there's always a um, at least one QTL, so at least one form of horizontal resistance, and then overlaying that, at least two to three dominant R genes. And then what we would plan to do is always shuffle the deck by altering those R genes. The other thing I didn't say, actually, is that none of this is being done by GM. This is all being done, actually, by um, marker-assisted selection which is why it's taking so long. So um, this is why we're doing all of this by serial back crossing. So we do all this by marker assisted selection. The reason for that is because the regulatory burden to get a GM crop deregulated in, in Kenya and in sub-Saharan Africa is too great. It would take so long to get it through regulation, even though we could make the transgene cassette much more easily. We're actually doing this by marker assisted selection so that everything we produce will actually be a... Um, a conventionally bred isolate um and we just felt that was actually a, a a better way to go we're actually i mean you know I, I think that um genetic technologies are hugely important and will become more and more important both gene editing and gene modification but for this project um we wanted to get these through the regulatory process and out to farmers as quickly as possible so we've we've done it through the conventional route even though the science is much harder because you need to do serial back crossing so you you don't get linkage drag of all those other potential associated um trait affecting factors yeah okay thank you um there's a, a question related to the plant breeding that from jan that i'm just going to skip to um i'm not ignoring the question from david which i'll come back to in a second but jan says related to this um in addition to the plant breeding efforts are there any effective antifungal strategies she's guessing not well, th there are there are fungicides that work against um, against rice blast, um, but many of them are being withdrawn. So, um, the best fungicide against rice blast was um, was tricyclozole, which is a melanin biosynthesis inhibitor. But it is an azole, and therefore it's um, it's been found to have endocrine disruption activity in um, in wildlife. So it's been withdrawn. So it's now banned from the European Union. It's still present and still being used, I think, in Japan and in quite a lot of the rest of the world, but um, it's uh, it's definitely banned in the, in the European Union. And um, other azoles are um, effective against Magnaportha, the ergosterol inhibitors, but there is a lot of resistance. So CYP51 mutations, strobulurins um, are also used against Magnaportha, but there is a lot of resistance against those because those are the um, quinone outside inhibitors. And again, you just need a single point mutation in cytochrome B to, to lead to uh, resistance. So there's lots of resistance against them. What we have done is we've we've worked on, so the septins and, um, and the septin associated uh, interactors are actually fairly potentially very good uh, fungicide targets. So we, we are thinking about trying to develop small molecules. And we, we had a pilot study, which um, we published a couple of years ago, working with um, a group in, um, in Chengdu um um with led by a former student of mine min ho and um and we um we actually identified some inhibitors of septin aggregation uh which work on fatty acid long chain biosynthesis and those are very effective fungicides against blast so there are ways that you could develop new fungicides but i think that 
what we're trying to do is develop more and more genetic approaches because because that uh, we're very conscious of the climate emergency and the fact that we've got to get away from fossil fuel derived farming methods so we're much more keen on trying to develop um, genetic approaches wherever we can but if we can discover really specific fungicides then then great but we're always aware of the potential problems with those Okay, so coming back to David's question, uh, David asks, if transmissoria are formed by necrotrophic fungi in order to penetrate the pit membranes, does this indicate that aprosoria evolved later when biotrophy evolved as a lifestyle? Well, that's a remarkably, um, that's a great question. Uh, I'd love to know the answer to that. I, I, again, I, I, you know, because very often you get this, the, you know, the um, th there tends to be a view that, you um, that you know canidia came first and then uh and then aprosorio developed and so on which which i tend to think of things being plant associated you know the first terrestrial fungi being plant associated so perhaps the transprosoria were as you say maybe the first structure to enable rapid colonization of um plant tissue aprosoria devolved you know could have evolved from those becoming melanized to enable them to get uv protection and and then the evolution of this turga driven infection process and there may be spores that derived from those but i you know I, it's um it's fascinating but i'm not um i would love to know the answers to that but i think it needs a, a lot of analysis by uh some evolutionary biologists but i think there are some people like Antonis Ruckus and indeed Paul, who's in the audience, I think Paul Dyer and others who are thinking about some of those processes, Laszlo Nagy and uh, and others I know, and um, Dave Hibbert are interested in some of those questions, but I would love to know the answer to that. But it is, it is, it's it's tantalizing that it might've gone in that direction and not the other direction as, as David's suggesting. Thank you. So you've mentioned Paul Dyer a couple of times. So Paul Dyer has a question for you. Um, he says, very nice talk. There have been reports that Magnaporta can infect roots. Any thoughts on how that might compare with leaf infection? Well, it can infect roots um, and uh, and you can show that in the lab. Now, whether it can infect roots in the field or, or ever does is much more of an open question because there's very little evidence that it does. Um, there's, there's no real field reports of rice um, blast infection of root tissue. But it has the capacity to do that. And when it does, it produces structures which look much more like hyperpodia than aprosoria. So it uh, it produces swollen structures, but they are quite different. Um, and uh, we know that process, again, is PMK1 dependent. But um, but many of the other um, genes that have been involved in aprosorial morphogenesis don't affect hyperpodia morphogenesis. Um, that process was studied in great detail by Annie Sesma and, um, and prior to that, Anne Osborne. But there's actually, as far as I'm aware, very few people studying it now. Um, I think the really interesting thing about root, uh, root infection is it mirrors the sort of evolutionary relationships of rice blast. Magnaporthus is quite closely related to goimanomyces, the take-all fungus that, um, that infects um, a whole series of cereals, but wheat in, in particular. And, um, and of course, that's a root infecting fungus. So I think uh, ancestrally, um, relatives of Magnaporthus certainly had the capacity to infect roots. But again, we just don't know the biological meaningfulness of it in terms of infections. We don't know whether it's happening a lot in the field because there are no reports of it. Okay. That um, draws it to close, I think. There are no more questions in the chat um, at the moment. Um, I'm sure if anybody has questions, they could take a look um, at your website at the Sainsbury Lab um, and yeah. contact you that way, Nick. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so it just uh, leaves us to say thank you very much.